just guessing at numbers and figures oh and the puzzles apart questions of science science and progress don't speak as loud as my heart nobody said it was easy it's such a shame for us to part nobody said it was easy no one ever said it would be so hard I'm going back to the stars Hello and good afternoon. My name is Frank Bush, president of the 2015 Business Week Committee. It is my pleasure to welcome you to Business Week's keynote address with our keynote speaker, Jack Hartung, CFO of Chipotle Mexican Grill. As we close out this week of events, we would like to thank you for your participation and involvement. We hope you enjoyed your experience and we look forward to Business Week 2016 at Illinois State University. Today, the college is more dependent upon private support than ever before. Through the generosity of our alumni, friends, and corporate partners, the college is able to provide enhanced technology, scholarships, program enhancements, and opportunities such as Business Week that help students improve their professionalism and readiness for future success. To speak on these efforts, Forever Redbirds and the Pay It Forward Business Scholarship, I'd like to introduce Vice President of Business Week 2015, Lindsay Hirschauer. Thank you, Frank. Later this spring, seniors will have an opportunity to participate in Forever Redbirds. This is a tradition that seniors participate in every year by paying it forward with a gift of $20.15. Seniors choose where to designate their gift, anywhere from a club to a college or a department. Seniors are encouraged to think about their time on campus and give back so future students can share the same great experiences. Today, we continue a new tradition of celebrating philanthropic support of the college by recognizing a group of alumni who are creating a new scholarship to benefit business students. The Pay It Forward Business Scholarship encourages other alumni to also support the college by collectively making a difference in students' lives the way education has made a difference for them. This scholarship was created through the efforts of Ron Witten, 80, Paul Koch, 80, Eric Miner, 78, Gary Ritchie, 83, Katie Hill Gotsman, 01, and Nate Webb, 07. If you are interested in making a gift to the College of Business, please contact Norris Porter, Director of Development, or Tony Birmingham, Associate Director of Development. To speak on Business Week staff and corporate support, I would like to reintroduce Frank Bush, President of Business Week. There are a number of staff and industry partners that I would like to thank for making Business Week possible again this year. Steve Vandiver, Director of Marketing, College of Business. Chris Knuth, Assistant to the Dean, College of Business. Joyce Parmenter, Chief Web Specialist, College
College of Business. Norris Porter, Senior Director of Development, College of Business. Tony Birmingham, Associate Director of Development, College of Business. And the 21 students of the 2015 Business Week Committee. Please join me in thanking them. We would also like to thank our 2015 corporate partners. Business Week would not be possible without their financial support and involvement. Platinum partner, State Farm Companies Foundation. Lead partners, Caterpillar Foundation and Country Financial. Supporting partners, Cintas and Enterprise Holdings Foundation, who are the featured partners for the fall golf outing. Deer and Company, who was the featured partner for our fall site day visit. Commerce Bank and Heritage Enterprises Incorporated, who are featured partners for the Professional Development Dinner. Our contributing partners, Farnsworth Group, Freight Car America, Gromark, Kensington Realty Advisors, Multi-Ad, Price Waterhouse Coopers, LLP, Standard Bank and Trust Company, Travelers Companies Foundation, Windmere Interiors, Zeos Global Ventures, LLC, McDonald's Restaurants and Little Jewels Learning Center. And finally, our featured corporate partner for the keynote address, Chipotle Mexican Grill. Please join me in thanking them. <laughs> and now I would like to introduce our interim dean of the College of Business, Dr. Jerry McKean. Thank you, Frank, and on behalf of the College of Business, uh, I'd like to extend my welcome to students, faculty and staff, administrators, friends and supporters of the College of Business, and honored guests. It's been an exciting week, Business Week 2015. I hope you've been able to participate. We've had engagement, interaction, learning, and reflection. Business Week 2015 and all Business Weeks, they are planned, organized and executed by students in the College of Business. This year's student group of Business Week, led by President Frank Bush and the entire Business Week team, they have done an, extend, an outstanding job. They have certainly earned my respect for what they've been able to accomplish, not, this, not just today, but this entire week and entire year. They meet once a week at least for an entire year to put on an event for our students, faculty and staff, the College of Business, the entire university and our community. So Frank and your team, I thank you for that. As Frank mentioned, when there's a, a group or an RSO, if you will, it really takes uh, other people, and he's mentioned those people as well, but the Business Week team has received unwavering support from our Director of Marketing, Steve Vandiver, and from our Senior Director of Development, Norris Porter. So their support and their counsel, I know, has been very much appreciated. I hope you've had the chance to attend many of the events this week. Started out on Monday with the Professionalism Dinner, that dinner we learn about professional etiquette, there's also a, a leadership portion. This year in the leadership portion, we learned how to write our obituary. Now that may seem odd to some of you if you were not one of the 430 in attendance at that particular event, but writing our obituary taught us about values and about the importance of life. So there's a lot of things that go on in business week. On Tuesday, we had the transition seminars. We had about 300 students participating in the transition seminars, finding out what is it like to take that first step from the college classroom to the office. And I trust that your first step will be better than my first step, when on my first day in a professional setting on a professional job, I turned off the computer system that ran the entire organization. On Wednesday, we had corporate social responsibility, and we learned that it's a lot more than just about working and making money. We learned about giving back, 
giving back to our college, giving back to our university, giving back to our community, and giving back to our world. And then just a very short time ago, we honored the successful accomplishments of some of the most outstanding alumni from the College of Business with the 2014-2015 induction ceremony into the College of Business Hall of Fame. And today, as we close our Business Week ceremonies, I know that we're going to be excited to hear from the CFO of one of the leading restaurant chains in America. So I'm really looking forward to that. You should expect nothing less from a university that is a top university and from a college of business that is a top college of business. Many of the academic programs in the college have a national ranking or a national recognition. So you should expect this type of activity, these type of activities all week long in Business Week. In each Business Week event that I participated, I spoke about engagement. Engagement is really what our accrediting body, the Association to Advance Collegiate Schools of Business, they put their theme, uh, their themes of engagement, innovation, and impact. And engagement is about when students are able to interact in professional settings in a meaningful way. Your Business Week 2015 team has provided those professional settings for engagement, and I hope you found that interesting, exciting, and a learning experience. It's been an excellent opportunity and setting for engagement. Now it's my pleasure and opportunity to introduce the 19th president of Illinois State University, Dr. Larry Dietz. Thank you. Thank you very much. I was a little late coming in here because I was uh, back in the office chomp, uh, chowing down on a nice chipotle bowl. <laughs> I heard from a speaker yesterday and never let the truth get in the way of a good story. That was a story. That was not the truth. But I uh, also want, it's not a good way to start re your remarks by giving an apology, but I have to do that today. I'm going to have to leave early. Uh, we have a provost candidate uh, on, on campus today, and I need to go back and interview the provost candidate. So it's in no way uh, an affront to our speaker. I've, uh, I've known uh, Jack for some time, and you're really in for a terrific treat. Uh, it's really uh, my pleasure today to, uh, uh, first of all, congratulate all the uh, Hall of Fame inductees that I got to meet over lunch today. It was a wonderful, uh, uh, wonderful event. I want to congratulate all the students who've been involved with Business Week. What a wonderful opportunity that you've had to show your leadership, demonstrate that, and what a great week it has been. I'm going to do my darndest uh, next year to try to get invi invited to that etiquette dinner. That sounds really good. I'm not sure about the obituary part of that, but nevertheless, I'd, I'd try to participate in all that. But uh, it's really uh, terrific to see students coming together, working with faculty, and producing such a uh, an important week like, like Business Week. So congratulations to everyone that's been involved with that. It's also my pleasure this afternoon to uh, introduce uh, a person who frankly I've not known very long, but um, uh, in my estimation, I, I, I hope he shares this, uh, I consider him in a very short uh, period of time certainly a good friend of mine and a good friend of the university, um, Mr. John Jack Horton. Uh, I've met him um, uh, most recently in Denver, and uh, the last two times that I've met, uh, we've met, it's been snowing like this, so you can blame the weather on Jack today. But uh, nevertheless, uh, uh, he was uh, kind enough to host us at a big alumni event in Denver uh, not terribly long ago, and was very generous with his time, with his uh, uh, resources there. Uh, we had the event in his uh, office building, and it was just a wonderful, wonderful time, and we really appreciate your hospitality, Jack. Uh, Jack is the uh, Chief Financial Officer of Chipotle Mexican Grill in, uh, Incorporated. He oversees all the aspects of the finance department, including financial and strategic planning, financial reports, investor relations, tax and business strategy of the nearly $20 billion company, billion with a B. He also oversees IT and safety, security and risk uh, uh, issues with the company. He joined Chipotle after spending 18 years at McDonald's, where he served in a variety of management positions, including vice president and chief financial officer of partner brands groups. 
Jack holds a bachelor's degree in accounting and economics as well as an MBA from Illinois State University. He earned a CPA and CMA shortly after graduating from ISU. In 2007, Jack was inducted into the Illinois State University College of Business Hall of Fame. He's not only been successful in business, he's given back. He has a wonderful family that uh, uh, we talked about in his office when I was out in Denver. And we share the commonality that uh, uh, he's a proud grandparent of two and very soon to be three uh, grandchildren. Uh, he's a mentor. He's an individual who supports this university. He's a person that we learn from every time we have an opportunity to interact with him. And he's a fine, fine human being. So it's my pleasure to uh, invite Jack Hartung to the podium. And please join me in welcoming him here. Jack. Degrees, you think I could do this myself, but <laughs> can't break the mouse. <laughs> the mouse, it's not a mouse. There it is. Does anybody see the mouse? <laughs> All right, we're good then. Thank you. Well, uh, thank you, President Dietz. I know you couldn't say, but but thank you for that wonderful introduction. I hope I can live up to uh, the buildup that he that he just gave, and and thank you, Dean McKean, for uh, inviting me here today, and then and then Frank and Lindsay and the uh, the whole Business Week uh, team for what I'm hearing is a great event. Everything I've heard is it's been a wonderful week. Um, the only thing I'm a little bit nervous about is everyone saying um, this is the end of it, and so now it's in my hands to make sure that it ends well. So it's a lot of pressure on me, but I'll I'll, I'll do the best that I can. Um, what I'd like to do is, is talk a little bit about um, my time at ISU, um, how I got my, my start and, and how I ended up at, at ISU. Uh, then I want to talk about Chipotle and I want to put it into the business context. Um, and I want to talk specifically about how the business model works at Chipotle. Um, and, and we have a sustainable model with our, with our food, the way we source our food, but we also need a sustainable model from a business standpoint as well. And it's critically important for us to achieve our mission. I want to talk about that. I also want to talk about the importance of having a vision. Um, it's important that a company has a, a vision. I want to share what that vision is for Chipotle and, and talk about the importance of having a vision and what it might be like if you don't have uh, a vision as a company. And I also want to talk about this concept called the genius of and. I don't know if you've heard of this concept in, in any of your business classes. Anyone here of the concept of genius of and? OK, so it'll, it'll be a, a little bit of a lesson today. So um, it's one of my favorite sayings and something I think applies to Chipotle and I think it can apply in a lot of um, you know, business and personal lives as well. So I love this little picture. This, this is a picture that, that Norris and uh, President Dietz had, had given me when they were out to Denver. Um, and I should thank Reggie for being such a, um, you know, such a loyal Chipotle fan. Um, I'm not sure how he gets that burrito in his beak. I'd love to see it. I'd love to see the mess that he made. Uh, but I thought this was a really cool picture. So I've got this picture uh, in my office now and I, I, I get a kick out of it every time I look at it. Um, so, uh, and, and by the way, we've had two events so far in Denver, and when uh, Norris first called me and said, we're going to have an event in, where, where's Norris? Norris is here somewhere. Yeah, when you first called me and said, we're going to have an ISU alumni event in Denver, I'm like, okay, we'll have a conference room with five or six or eight of us or something. 70 people showed up or something, or 80 people or something like that showed up, and then we had another one in the snowstorm, and there were still 50 or 60. And what a joy to have all of these people I've never met before, yet instantly felt like we were friends and we had a connection and we talk about ISU and some were business majors, some were uh, you know, teachers, they were nurses, they were you know, from all walks of life and, and yet we had this instant connection because we could talk about our time back at, at ISU. And when I, when I think about ISU and I think about uh, where I'm at today and where things started, um, a lot of my roots, both from a business standpoint and from a personal standpoint, started here. Uh, I met my wife, Nancy, uh, here. Uh, we, in fact, we got married. I graduated in 79 with an undergrad, graduated uh, in 80 with a master's. Nancy and I got married in 1980. She also was an accounting graduate, accounting master's. She taught for a year because she finished a year before I did, and she was nice enough to stay an extra year. Um, and so, um, you know, we, we, we started our family together. We went on to have 
uh, five great kids. My oldest uh, went to ISU, graduated from ISU in 2006. He would be here and Nancy would be here, except his baby is due any day now. And so, um, and when President Dietz was talking about being a grandfather for the third time in just 11 months, I can't help but smile. Now, you know, I don't feel like I'm old enough to be a grandpa. I know you think I look old enough, but it happens fast, I tell you. And it, it is the joy of our life. And so, uh, not just, ISU is not just prep for my career. Um, my personal life started here, my family life started here, and so we have real, uh, you know, deep, deep roots here. Then when I think about how I landed at ISU, um, I'm so lucky because when I was a senior in high school, I didn't know where I wanted to go to school. And I waited too long and I wasn't sure what, what I wanted to study. And one of my friends said, he's going to ISU. And I'm like, well, what, what's at ISU? I didn't know anything about it. And he told me about it and, and I said, okay, fine. So I signed up, never stepped foot on the campus before. Uh, I know it sounds crazy, right? I'm sure nobody did that, right? I'm the only one in the room that just showed up at school the first day. Uh, I didn't know what to study either, and so I talked to my older brother who was at U of I, and he said, we should study accounting, because I was always good at math. Um, I stunk at things like science and geography and things like that, but I was good at math. He said, well, go into accounting. And he told me about the career that I could have in accounting, but he said, if you're gonna study accounting, you have to go to U of I. He goes, so okay, it's August, you gotta go to ISU, but you gotta transfer to U of I, because it's got the best accounting program in the Midwest, is what he declares. So he's my older brother, he must know better, right? So I say, okay. So my plan was go to ISU for a year or two, transfer to U of I, get my accounting degree. Well, it didn't take long for that plan to not feel right. Uh, I came to ISU and right away felt like I belonged here. It felt like the professors really cared about the students. They reached out and connected with the students. Um, I made friends. In fact, one of my good friends who don't throw anything, uh, Rookie, is, is here in the front row. Uh, Steve is his real name. Uh, so I still have great friends. Uh, from ISU, and, and I felt this connection both in the classroom and, and from a personal standpoint. And when I would visit my brother at U of I, I didn't feel that same connection. It didn't feel like it was right for me. And so, um, so I, the plan changed. I decided, um, you know, I, I really want to stay at ISU. I started looking in the accounting program. Well, the accounting program is outstanding, as you know today. Well, back then I didn't know that, but it was, it was great and rising. And so I thought, oh my God, I, you know, so I, I lucked out. I ended up at ISU, it felt right. I could stay here for accounting. Um, now, brothers, as you know, are competitive. And so my brother is a few years older than me. So we went to this great school, right? So he took the CPA, I took the CPA from ISU. I crushed him, <laughs> crushed his score. So, so I feel fortunate that I landed here. I feel fortunate that I, ch I chose something that I could be successful at and that I, I was fortunate that ISU had this great and building, uh, building program. Uh, and so I feel really forever indebted to ISU for uh, the, the, the prep it's given me for my career, uh, for meeting my wife and friends and for the family life we, we have today. So as you're sitting here today, and I, I, I know you're, you're probably ranging from freshman to senior to graduate school, um, you should feel really proud to be a Redbird. You should feel really good about your lot in life right now. You should feel good that the investment that you're making in yourself, because that's what you're doing, you're making an investment of, of time and energy in yourself, you should feel good that this is going to prepare you for a successful career, wherever that career might take you. And so you should, you should feel you know, really, really good about that. I, I know in looking back on it, I owe so much to ISU, and um, you should feel proud to be a, a Redbird yourself. So let's talk Chipotle. So Chipotle started in 1993 by a, a young chef, uh, Steve Ells. He was 27 years old. Uh, he was a classically trained chef. He never intended Chipotle to be a chain. He's going to open up one restaurant. Uh, the idea was he, his only experience was fine dining. So he's going to open up this one restaurant. Uh, it was small. This is 850 feet. A typical Chipotle restaurant is about 2,500 feet. So imagine a Chipotle restaurant about a third that size. It's tiny, tiny, tiny but it's what he could afford. He had to borrow $85,000 from his dad at the time, and he was an incredible cook. Okay, he was a kid that, when he was in grade school, he was watching, not cartoons, he was watching Julia Child, okay, a cooking show back in the day. And this is before cooking shows had all these celebrity chefs. It would be very unusual for an eight or nine or 10 year old kid to be watching Julia Child. But that's what he did. In high school, he would have dinner parties, real dinner parties, you know, with five and six and seven course meals. And not a keg of beer, it would be nice wine. I mean, he was really into fine dining. 
uh, after he went to, to college, got a degree in, I think, art history or something like that. Um, God knows what, you know, what he was going to do with that, but, but he decided when he left school, he wanted to cook. So he went to the Culinary Institute of America in, in New York, uh, left CIA, uh, worked in fine dining, and after a few years, he was inspired by the local taquerias in California. That was in, in San Francisco is where this, this restaurant that he worked at. These are these little taquerias that were serving street food. And he thought, my God, that's brilliant where you can serve food. And, and, and the burritos and tacos is just the way that you serve it. But he could bring his fine dining cooking, his culinary skills, to, to the service format. And it could be simple and accessible. That was his idea to open up Chipotle. It was going to be one restaurant. He would run it for a few years, save up some money, and then open up a fine dining restaurant. Well, there was nothing like Chipotle at the time. Okay? Everything he did was cooking from scratch. I mean, the level of detail to, to, to produce the perfect burrito was incredible. You know, things like he would toast the cumin, he would roast the peppers. Uh, oregano comes out of a, you shake it out of a jar, right? Well, not a Chipotle. They come in stems, little leaves. You pull them off, even today, you pull them off by hand, you cut them by hand. And so all this detail, braising the meats, marinating the meats by hand, everything was done the way it would be done in a fine dining restaurant, yet it was done in this very accessible format. And so there's no food like this at this time. It was a hit right away. Uh, food critics even came in to the restaurant, which typically would not visit a, uh, you know, a fast food restaurant like this or a quick service restaurant like this. And the food critics recognized the sophisticated cooking, wrote very positive stories, and so it was a, it was a hit right out of the box. So he thought, I better open one more. That one did better. Okay, one more. That one did better. And so, so on, he opened up the next one, the next one, and now we have nearly 1,800 restaurants. We have 17 restaurants outside the U.S. We have two new brands. Uh, one is called Shop House Southeast Asian Kitchen, which is the best way I can describe it is it's the Asian version of Chipotle. Okay, really delicious. And then we have a pizzeria concept as well called Pizzeria Locale, and I would also call that it's the, the Chipotle version of uh, Pizzeria Locale. And I'll talk a little bit more about those later. So somewhere along the way, Steve realized that he could serve way more people way better food and really elevate the dining experience by opening up more Chipotle's. And so it was just one of these, just like I accidentally landed at ISU, Steve accidentally you know, landed uh, as the co-CEO of, a, of, a, of a, major, a major chain. So now we have this vision. And when I say now, we've had this vision for more than 10 years. So when we were a small restaurant, just a you know, hundred or a couple hundred restaurants or so, we had this vision to change the way people think about and eat fast food. And I think it's critically important for a company to have a vision. It's important to have a vision that matters. It's important to have a vision that people understand what the vision is, that they buy into the vision, that they want to commit to the vision, and that they know what their job is in contributing to that vision. And so we have this vision that we want to change the way people think about and eat fast food. Um, and this could seem daunting. I mean, we're not quite 2,000 restaurants. There are tens of thousands, many tens of thousands, maybe 100,000 traditional fast food. And when I say traditional fast food, I'm thinking about Taco Bell, McDonald's, you know, things like that. There are tens of thousands of them. And so for us to say we're going to change that whole industry or change the way people think about fast food with less than 2,000, that's, that's a fairly daunting task. But that's what a vision should be. It's even more daunting when you think back 10 or more years ago when we had just a few hundred restaurants and we're thinking we're going to change fast food. So we had this vision that we were really going to do something. We were going to rock the fast food world, and that was our objective. And so our objective along the way was to put together a business model and put together strategies to achieve this vision. So what would happen if a company didn't have a vision? And let me give you an example. Uh, back in the 50s, okay, um, I'm going way back to the 50s, the biggest company in the world, what's the biggest company in the world today? It's in your pocket, every one of your pockets, Apple. Right? You guys don't know that? Okay. Apple is like $700 billion. They're, they're going to be the first you know, trillion dollar company. Anybody have any idea what the largest company in the world was uh, back in the 50s? GM. Yeah, GM, General Motors. Okay. General Motors was the largest, most successful company um, in, in its time, in the 50s. Okay. So I went back and did some research to find out, well, you know, where did it go wrong? And there's a lot of things that they could have done differently. But in the 50s, their CEO at the time 
made this statement, declared this statement proudly. He goes, we're not in the business of making automobiles. We're in the business of making money. Okay? I believe that's a fatal statement. Okay? A business that's in the business just to make money, it's really hard to rally around that. It's really hard to get employees to rally around that. Listen, it's great to make money. You know, you want to buy new clothes. You want to buy your, the, the next version of the iPhone. Sure, you need money, but to have that to be your purpose in life, to have that to be your vision, it's, I, think it's, I think that's a rudderless company. And I think when you're a rudderless company, competition comes in and they outflank you and they do a better job, whether it's better cast mileage, whether it's better designed cars, more reliability. Well, that happened all along the way. And so GM went from this largest, most successful company in the world with a 50% or nearly 50% market share. Today, it's got about a 17% market share. It's worth about $60 billion. A few years ago, during the financial crisis, it was worth about $5 billion. It was less, less than $10 billion, whereas Apple's worth $700 billion today. So not having a vision isn't the only thing that went wrong at GM. But I think when you look at companies that are struggling, if you go and look and see what their vision is, I would guess that more times than not, they either don't have a vision, it's not a compelling vision, or people are not rallying around it. So if you have a vision worth rallying around, it can be very, very powerful. So when you're leaving ISU and you're interviewing with companies or you're researching companies, see if they have a vision. See if it's on their website. See when you're meeting people if they know the vision. If it's something they say, oh yeah, yeah, I got a vision. Let me look, it's in my drawer somewhere. That's not a vision. Okay, they're not rallied around it. Sure, it's a vision, but it's much more powerful if they know the vision. They go, oh yeah, we have a vision. Okay, we know exactly what it is, and they rally around it, and they're committed to it, that's more likely to be a successful company. So with our vision, having the right vision is a start, but then you've got your, to, to build your business around that vision. Um, having a vision to just have world peace, it's wonderful. How would you achieve it? How would you get there? Okay, but our vision to change the way people think about, uh, think about and eat fast food, we have three main strengths that we focus on. Uh, we focus on having a very strong food culture, very strong people culture, and a strong business model. Okay, and from a, hopefully, a lot of you are familiar with what we're doing from a food standpoint. Our food culture involves buying sustainably raised ingredients. It involves the inspiration from that video that you saw, where Willie Nelson was singing, um, you know, over, over that back to the start. The idea is to buy sustainably, sustainably raised food. Okay, food that is raised with respect for the animals, respect for the environment. Um, it involves taking whole ingredients and doing real cooking so you can serve delicious food. So it's not only more responsible, it's delicious food, and it's more healthful as well because you're talking about real food without preservatives, without additives, uh, things like that. So it's important for us to have a very strong food culture. And at Chipotle, while we don't add many things to the menu, over the last, the menu today is almost identical to what it was in 1993. All the ingredients are different, they're all better. The cooking techniques are better. And so we focus on this food culture where we're constantly making what we already serve better. And so it's important that we continue to do that. Now one challenge is the sustainably raised ingredients are expensive. So you have to pay for that somehow. So it puts our business model at a disadvantage. Okay? Um, and, I'll, and I'll talk about that in, uh, in, in a little bit. Um, actually, one more, one more point about that. So, so our food costs, because of this investment we're making in, in these higher quality ingredients, our food cost is the highest in the restaurant industry. Okay, so now we're all in the business world here, right? So when you take your largest expense item and it's higher as a percentage of sales than any other restaurant company out there, it puts you at a disadvantage from a business standpoint, right? Okay, so our business model is either at risk or we've got to find a way to offset that. And I'll cover that in a minute. We also strive to have this, this uh, special and unique people culture, and our people culture is very different than any other restaurant company for sure. It's different than a lot of even non-restaurant companies out there. Um, and somebody before the, I, you know, I asked somebody in Business Week, I said, what, what would you like to hear? And they said about the business, uh, the people culture. I'm like, oh crap, that could take hours and hours and hours, and I love talking about it, um, but I don't have time for it. So I'm going to give you a few headlines, and then maybe in Q&A, if we have time, I hope we'll have time for Q&A, we can cover some more of it. But to start, one thing that we do completely different than other restaurant companies, we don't franchise. Okay, franchising is something that you do when you want somebody else to run the business, you want somebody else to hire and train and lead people. Okay, we, 
own and operate all of our restaurants, all 1,800, even, even the ones outside the U.S. So we have 55,000 employees. So we have this people culture that's centered around hiring great people. And when I say great people, I don't mean restaurant experience. Okay? You can come to Chipotle and work in our restaurants with no restaurant experience, but great people means great character. Okay? We have something called 13 characteristics that, that we look for, and these are things you can't teach, you can't learn in school. These are things like uh, being respectful, being curious, being ambitious, okay, being hospitable, okay, being smart. Okay, not necessarily book smart, but just smart, being alert. Okay? We look for these things to hire uh, when we're hiring people because as we're hiring the 55,000 people, we want every single person to have the ability to make it to manager or beyond to go as far as they can. And so we know that if they come in with the right character, we can teach them how to cook. We can teach them how to run a restaurant. We can teach them how to lead people. We can teach them how to run a business. Okay? And if they come, with the, come in with the right character, we can do all those things that can have a successful career with Chipotle. So our people culture is critically important because we run all of our restaurants. We also promote all of our managers from within, from Crew. About 95% of our managers come from Crew. So it's important that when we hire each of these 55,000 employees that they have the ability, the desire um, to lead someday. Now it doesn't mean they have to want a career at Chipotle. You can be a college student and come and work for Chipotle while you're going to school, that's great. But you have to have the character I talked about, and you have to want to be part of a special team. And you can be part of Chipotle, and then go off, and you know you can pursue your nursing degree or accounting degree. But we won't hire you unless you have those 13 characteristics, and you have the desire to be part of a very, very special team. So I can talk a lot more about the people culture, but it's profoundly important for our business uh, for us to be able to, to, to run all of our restaurants uh, to have this very special people culture. And the third thing that we, that we focus on is having this, this very strong um, business model. And, and when I talk about a strong business model, um, I'm primarily talking about two different elements of that business model for Chipotle. Uh, one is, is, is the model needs to create value. Okay? And very simply, creating value means um, you, you get more out of something. Whatever you put in, you get more out of it. So if you're going to make an investment, the investment has to be worth more in the future. The reason for that is you can't invest, for example, in opening up new restaurants if you don't create value. Okay? You run out of capital. If you borrow from the bank, eventually you're going to run out of money and you can't open up any more restaurants. So you need to be able to invest, in our case, invest in restaurants with the idea that the amount that you invested is going to be worth more after you make the investment and after you run the restaurants. Now, Chipotle is in good shape here. Okay? We've been working on this for a long time. We've been working on this hand in hand with our vision for over a decade. So one way to measure creating value um, is to look at returns, return on investment. And so if you look at just the restaurant level at Chipotle, we invest about 800000 to open up a restaurant. Does that sound like a lot? Those restaurants look pretty simple, right? Nobody thinks we spend 800000 but believe me, we do. We find a way to invest 800000 After a few years, though, we have the ability to generate 500000 to 600000 in each restaurant in cash flow. So that's a return of 60 to 70 percent. It's by far the best in the industry. Okay, it's it's for, for in most cases it's double what other restaurant companies uh, are earning. So we have this ability to 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 today uh, create lots of value. Okay, so that part of the formula is working for us. But what about sustainability? And in sustainability, I define that as uh, where the business is able to remain healthy, okay, and be profitable enough to invest in our purpose. Okay, when I get up and talk to our entire company, our enti all of our managers, I talk about the fact that we're not in business to make money. I take the opposite approach of GM. We're not in the business to make money. We're in, we, we make money to invest in our purpose. Okay, so we have to be able to have this business model where we can invest it back into our purpose. So I mentioned before that, that our food cost is the highest in the industry. Okay, puts you at a disadvantage. All right, the way most business models work, and think about a Whole Foods, for example. Whole Foods has ingredients similar to Chipotle, right? Okay, is there a Whole Foods in Normal, Bloomington, somewhere? No? Okay, but you guys are familiar with Whole Foods, right? It's great. But it's similar ingredients to Chipotle, very expensive, but they charge a lot. Okay, so their business model works where they will charge more to buy the ingredients, but they charge you more. And so they're funding their business model by charging premium prices. We don't do that at Chipotle. Okay, if you go to Qdoba, I'm not advising you to go to Qdoba, but if you 
stumble into, you better not be going to Qdoba for sure over there. If you stumble into a Qdoba by mistake someday, let's say it that way, you'll pay about the same for Qdoba as you do for Chipotle. They don't have food with integrity. Their food cost is a lot lower than ours. The reason we need our business model to work that way, unlike Whole Foods, is our vision is to change the way people think about and eat fast food. Not some people. Hey, Whole Foods, not everyone can afford Whole Foods. That's why they call it Whole Paycheck. Okay, that's their nickname. <laughs> our model is based on buying the expensive food, charging the same price as you'd pay at a Panera or a Potbelly's or Qdoba or in that same ballpark, okay, so that you can, everyone can afford to eat at, at Chipotle. So, again, as a business group, you're probably thinking, oh my God, okay, so they're charging the same prices, their food cost is high, their margins must stink. They're not, they're, they don't. They're, they're, the margins are the best in the industry. Okay, just like our returns are the best in the industry. And by margins, I just mean take sales, minus our expenses, food costs, labor, rent occupancy, things like that. What's left over after paying all the expenses, that net cash flow from the restaurant divided by our sales is the highest in the industry. So how do we do that? Doesn't seem like it should work that way, right? Well, because we've been so focused on our vision over, the, you know, over these many years, um, we look for efficiencies everywhere, all, everywhere else but on the food line. Okay, so we look for efficiencies in building a small restaurant. Okay, less rent, less upkeep. Um, we look for efficiencies with our labor model. Actually, one of the best efficiencies we have is because we don't keep adding things to the menu. Okay, we can get really good and really efficient at cooking terrific, delicious food and serving people very quickly. Um, you know, during a, a very tight lunch hour. And so we work hard to find efficiencies everywhere else so that we can spend more on the food. And it's a great way to run the business, right? So you guys get to pay about the same as you'd pay over at Qdoba, okay? But you're getting much higher quality ingredients. It'd be like shopping at Whole Foods but paying Piggly Wiggly prices, okay? It's a great value from a customer standpoint, and it allows everyone to enjoy Chipotle. And so this is, I mentioned this concept called Genius of Anne. The genius of AND is when a company in, it, it refuses to compromise on what's important. A typical restaurant company might think in terms of, um, I can either have qual high quality ingredients or charge low prices, but not both. Or, or if I have high quality ingredients, I either have to charge a higher price or accept low margins, okay? So you can't have all three. Well, our vision depends on all three. Buying expensive food, high quality, sustainably raised ingredients, charging a fair price so it's a, everyone can afford to go there, and then having attractive margins so that we can continue to reinvest in our business. And Economics 101 would tell you when businesses have uh, high returns and high margins, usually competition comes in, okay? And that's gonna push the margins down, push the returns down. It's hard to do with the way we've set this model up because if you're another restaurant company, if you're Qdoba, and you're gonna say, I'm gonna do food with integrity. Well, their food cost goes up right away, their margins aren't close to what Chipotle's are, and so either they gotta charge a lot more or they have to accept much lower margins. And they're already way lower than Chipotle. And so this business model we've been working on over the last decade as we've been pursuing this vision to find efficiencies everywhere else but on the food line is really uh, resulting in a very unique, a very strong business model that we think is gonna allow us to continue to pursue our vision for a very, very long time to come. So I wanna talk a little bit about fast food because I'm, I'm implying by the fact that we want to change it that there must be something, something wrong with fast food. And there's nothing wrong with fast because at Chipotle, we pride ourselves on, on serving you fast, even when there's a long line. But with fast food, it's, it's the problem's more with the food. Okay, the problem's more with the quality of the food. And as a kid, I used to eat at McDonald's. And of course, you know, I worked at McDonald's for a long time. And back in the day when they first started, they had a very simple menu. They had just a few ingredients and it was fresh meat on the grill. It was potatoes that they'd make the fries. It was real ingredients. Uh, it was accessible, it was fast, it was affordable, and it was kind of in the day. It was like the Chipotle of the day. But over time, the fast food model has added many, many more things to the menu. Um, it's gotten w very complicated. It's very deal-driven, okay? And so all those deals have, has, has basically re related or resulted in driving costs out of the food line. That's the only way to make it work. When you're offering a 99 cent something, okay, you have to engineer costs out of somewhere, and the typical fast food model has engineered it out of the, out of the food cost, which we think is a, is a bad way to do it. So, um, and let me give you a couple examples about this. Um, 
You know, one great example, Jack in the Box back in the 70s when I was, in, you know, when I was at ISU, uh, there was a two taco deal at the time that you can get for $2, okay? Today, you can go to Jack in the Box and you can get two tacos for $2, okay? So it's been 35 years, 36 years or so. If you adjusted that $2 for inflation, today that would cost somewhere around $4 or 450 or something like that, depending on what inflation assumption you, 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 know, you come up with. So the only way to make that work is over the years, costs are engineered out of the food cost. And that's resulted in things like raising animals more in larger farms, in close quarters. It's resulted in the, the, the need for using antibiotics. Um, it's, it's resulted in things like, like um, uh, uh, increased use of, of pesticides, uh, GMOs and things like that. It's resulted in things that have created efficiencies, but at a cost. And we think those efficiencies um, just aren't, aren't worth it. And so we'd like to go back, backward. It's kind of the back to the start. We'd like to go back to the traditional way of raising animals, raising crops, um, without this kind of factory approach to raising food. Yes, it's more expensive. But when you go to a fast food restaurant and you're paying a relatively low price, the, the part of the price you're not seeing is the impact on the environment, the suffering you know, that the animals are going through, uh, the impact on your health perhaps over time. And so uh, we don't think that that price is worth, um, uh, you know, the discount that you might be paying at a fast food restaurant. So um, I'd like to show just a quick video to give you an idea of, I want to contrast the messaging that Chipotle, you saw back to the start, I have another video to show you compared to the typical fast food model with advertising. And oh, here we go. With the new dollar menu and more, more is what you get. For just a dollar, get the crunchy, tangy, brand new barbecue ranch burger. For only two bucks, grab the new bacon cheddar McChicken with thick cut applewood smoked bacon. Only on the dollar menu and more. The word is out. Introducing flatbread grilled chicken now at Wendy's. Checkers new Lil Philly sandwich. Chut ching. Try the amazing new French fry burger. Only a dollar. Burger King, where taste is king. KFC Original Recipe, now available without the bone. Freshly prepared white or dark meat chicken, boneless and skinless. New flatbread sandwiches from Panera, each 360 calories or less. Try one today. The new AM Crunch Wrap. Eggs, bacon, cheese, and a hash brown inside. It's the all-in-one breakfast. The Buffalo Chicken Strip Small Combo Meal, just $4.99. Burger King, where taste is king. Okay, I might need help getting out of this. So, do you want to get us back to the side? So, the point here is, it's very deal-driven. It's very kind of hurry up. Don't you feel kind of like you got to hurry up and go because, you know, it's a deal that's going on? That's what fast food has turned into. The fast food marketing is intended to get you in, to get a new menu item, you know, to, to get you in for a deal. I heard somebody laughing about the French fry burger. I mean, there's all kinds of crazy things out there. It's all intended to entice you to come into the restaurant. Versus, this is you know, the way Chipotle wants to communicate with our customers. Compare with 
Chipotle. It's not intended to um, talk about this new menu item or the 99 cents something. It's intended to cause you to think. It's a, it's a satire. It's not real, obviously. But we would rather encourage people to think about where their food comes from, to be curious about where their food comes from, to ask questions about it. And we think the more questions you ask, that's likely to lead to better food supply in this country. It's also likely to lead to, to, to you um, wanting to visit Chipotle more often. And so We'd rather invest in, in uh, a message like, like that to cause people to think and become curious than to just cause people to think, I better hurry up and get to Chipotle before that late, latest deal opens. So got a couple more slides just to wrap it up here. Um, I mentioned Shop House and Pizzerillo Cali, and there actually is a pizza, picture of some delicious pizza that's not showing up right now. Trust me, it looks great. The typical fast food model is to add a million things to the menu board, okay, which means it's really complicated. You have to take shortcuts. The food has to come in, already processed, and then re-thermalize. It's really hard to do real cooking when you have a million things on the menu. Our approach to variety is to, is, is to create new brands. And so we're going to keep the Chipotle menu simple so we can continue, continue to invest higher quality food. But then we're going to invest in opening up new concepts. We have nine shop house uh, restaurants. Okay, And again, think of them as the, the Asian version of Chipotle. They're right now just in DC and LA. And so it's going to be a, it's not a fast growth yet. These are still very new brands that we're nurturing. And Pizzeria Locale, we have two of them. They're both in Denver. But we think this is a better way to offer variety, a better way to change the way people think about any fast food than to try to do too much in Chipotle, which is going to result in compromise. And we will lose that genius of Ann that I talked to you about before. So one final exercise, because I do want to leave some time for a few questions. So because we're a business group, there's a lot of finance majors. I thought we should talk about how you, do, how you value a business. And so uh, these are all public companies. And so you can value their business, or you can take the total value of the business by taking their stock price times the number of shares. You get a total company value and divide it by the number of restaurants. And that's what this result is. And so Jack in the Box, for example, their average restaurant's worth $800,000. So it's about what Chipotle invests in a restaurant. All the way up to McDonald's, each restaurant's worth about $2.6 uh, two, sorry, 2.6 million per restaurant. So, Chipotle, where do you think Chipotle might fall on this? Any idea? Any guess? Five million? Okay, that's a bold, answer, bold response. Anybody else? Three? How about 12? So how can that be? These are businesses that have been around for a long time. Well, this is what you can get. It can be a profound effect when you have a different business model. So part of it is we don't franchise. Okay, franchising divvies up the business model. We don't franchise. Secondly, we look for efficiencies in things that don't matter that much. And so that allows us to invest more in food and save money and all the things that don't matter that much to you when you visit Chipotle. And then we have a lot of growth because we have these high returns, these high margins, because we have a message that's resonating with people Wall Street is optimistic about our future. And so those three things cause us to have our business to have a profoundly uh, greater result than these other restaurant companies. So uh, with that, um, thank you for your time today. I'd love to answer any questions you might have.
Thank you, Jack. That was fantastic. Uh, we're now going to open it up to Q&A. Nick's going to be around here with the microphone. Uh, we'd invite you, thank you, we'd invite you as well to uh, use our Twitter feed, and we'll do some questions at the end off that. That is hashtag BWISU2015. So now we will open up to questions. Thank you, Frank. What, what was the biggest challenge you guys had as you were rolling out the, the number of stores? The biggest challenge we've ever had, and the biggest challenge we still have, is people. Uh, we have to hire 55,000 people every single year. We have, to, we have to, to develop several hundred managers every single year. The restaurant business is a fairly high turnover business. A lot of people are working while they're going to school or you know, as they're getting ready for a, you know, a, 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 a career that they want outside of the restaurants. And so this idea, if we don't do a good job of hiring the right people, and if we don't have the right leaders that are developing them, and developing, developing in Chipotle isn't just about teaching how to use a knife, teaching how to grill. Developing means teaching them how to be great leaders. Okay? We, for example, define a top performer as probably exactly what you think they are. They do a good job. Okay? So if you hire them on the grill, they do a great job on the grill. Our definition goes further. It says they do a great job on the grill, but they make others around them better. Okay? That's an expectation of all 55,000 employees. And we teach them how to do that. We encourage them how to do that. Then we teach our leaders how to empower great people. Once you hire people with great character, once you train them, you know, how to use a knife, how to cook on a grill, once you encourage them to help others. And that means the person hired last month can tell the grill guy that's been here for five years that the chicken wasn't cooked right, that the grill marks aren't right, okay? That takes special leadership, which we teach. And it really, it, it's not really even that special. It's not that tricky. You know what it involves? Is connecting with people and trusting each other. Trusting that when the crew that started a month ago is not trying to show up, the guy in the grill, he's trying to make the restaurant better. And when you, as a leader, create a culture like that in a restaurant, everybody in the restaurant wants to do everything they can to make the restaurant better. Okay? And if they do that, they're going to get additional leadership opportunities. Okay? They're going to take on more responsibility within the restaurants. They'll have the opportunity to go beyond the restaurant and then oversee some you know, maybe multiple Chipotle restaurants because of the impact they have on people, because of the leadership ability they have. So that's the single most important thing that we've, it's the most important challenge. It was 10 years ago, it is today, and it'll be 10 years from now as well. Thank you. Yes, sir. Uh, I love Chipotle. Uh, one thing I noticed is a lot of your stores aren't in more uh, rural areas. They, they are in rural or not? Are not, like from yeah. where I'm from, like half hour out of like a bigger city. Do you think uh, Chipotle would ever advance, and, or not advance, but see themselves moving into more rural areas to get more customers, or is that kind of like maybe a waste of resources? Eventually, with 1,800 restaurants, um, right now, you, you want to fish where the fish are biting. Okay, so we're going to open up 200 restaurants. And so we have the opportunity for more restaurants in New York City and Chicago and San Francisco and all these big cities. What we typically do is, as we go from a big city, like for example, we have a restaurant in Decatur. You know, we have two here now. Okay, um, uh, we have two, I think, in Champaign. Uh, when the brand becomes, when Chipotle becomes very well known in the major city nearby, and then you, you know, have restaurants, for example, we've moved from Chicago to Notre Dame to Indiana, then you start filling in, and then I do think some of these smaller towns, now it depends on how small, you know, a couple thousand people is, would be hard. We wouldn't have those 60 and 70 percent returns if we open up in a town of 1,000. So, but I do think that we can come up with, and we're working on a model where there's even a smaller restaurant, where the investment could be a little bit lower, so that we can bring Chipotle to more people in, in smaller towns. Because it, it is part of our vision. We don't want to leave people out, but right now we're gonna fish where the fish are biting. Okay. You guys have to have a tough question out there. Yeah. One you think I possibly can't answer. And it, was Chipotle part of McDonald's at one time? What was that experience? And why did you flourish after that relationship? Yeah, the question was, was Chipotle part of McDonald's? Chipotle was started, as I mentioned, by Steve Ells uh, as a chef. Uh, he had to raise money. Steve does not like raising money. He likes, he likes to cook, he loves to cook. He's always talking about the next meal. When he's eating this meal, he's thinking about the next meal. And he's very sophisticated and, and he just loves every bit about food. And so at some point, he spent too much time raising money to open up the next restaurant or the next two or the next three restaurants. So in 1997 or 98, they went to McDonald's. They, they decided, the board at the time as a private company, they had 12 restaurants, decided they'd go look for a strategic investor. Not private equity, not Wall Street, a strategic investor. They knocked on a bunch of doors, all of them shut, except McDonald's. 
Yum, so Taco Bell, you know, he went to all of them. And at the time, McDonald's said, oh, okay, we'll give it a try. And so McDonald's invested in them, but left Chipotle alone. There were signs that Chipotle could be a special brand all by itself, so Chipotle was left alone. Uh, some people, like I had the privilege of, of, in 2000, before I joined Chipotle, to start working with Chipotle to help advise them in terms of how to think about the business. There were a few other people, but they were separate businesses. At some point, it was pretty apparent that the cultures, the vision, what we stood for and what McDonald's stood for, they couldn't coexist. And so we separated in 2006, um, three different transactions, um, an IPO, a follow-on offering, and then a split off. Um, and so uh, by the end of 2006, McDonald's had no investment whatsoever. Um, I did go through an interesting exercise that I should share with you. McDonald's made a lot of money on Chipotle, invested 350 million bucks, made 1.1 billion, so they tripled their money. Okay, but we're now a $22 billion company. They own 90% of us. Okay, so they could have, if they didn't ruin Chipotle, 18 billion or 19 billion or something like that. So it was viewed as a very successful financial deal at the time, but Chipotle has just shot up from then. And, and of course, McDonald's is struggling now because people's curiosity about food is growing. And the more they learn about it, the more they're saying, I'm not sure I want to go there. Okay, yes, sir. Yeah. Yeah, I don't think you guys could hear that. I don't think his mic's on. Um, okay. But the question is about marketing. How do you market? You don't see much marketing. Um, this never saw TV. We don't do any TV marketing. Um, this went viral. It actually, at the end of it, you saw there was a game. It actually was to market a, a game. I guess the game was really hard. Nobody could, could complete it. I didn't even try it. Uh, but but the, the 12 million people saw that. Okay. And so we would rather, if you saw it and liked it, send it to a friend. We'd rather, and that's kind of word of mouth, uh, you know, the curiosity and the discussion happen, happen that way. We do some traditional marketing like billboards, we do some radio, but it's never deal oriented. It's never hurry up, it's never new item. It'll be more informational, it might be entertaining. Um, we really want to respect the intelligence of our customers. Uh, we want to create curiosity, we want to create a bond with our customers. And we don't want to insult them with, with, with saying, hurry up and come in before this deal is over. And so when you do see a billboard or do see, you know, hear a, a, a radio spot, um, it's going to seem different than a, than, a typical, um, you know, than a typical commercial. We also spend way less than fast food marketing. McDonald's spent $1 billion last year in the U.S. in marketing alone. Our sales were $4, $4 billion. Okay, so they spend like 25% of our whole sales. And we spend a fraction. We spend about a percent of our sales. Um, typical fast food would spend about 4%. So as a percentage of sales, about four times what we spend, okay? When we go to a new market and with our new brands, we would rather, like let's say you never, you've never been to Chipotle, you know what I would do right now? I'd say, free Chipotle for everybody. Okay, well you all know Chipotle, so I can't do that. But the idea being that I would rather spend zero on marketing, invite you to Chipotle, and then just be confident that you're gonna like it and come back. And if you don't, that's okay too, but the food is good and people like it and they do come back. So it is more word of mouth, it is more discovery than it is marketing driven. Very different than the typical fast food model. Hi. Um, I've, I've seen that Chipotle has actually expanded to London and Paris and I've read that um, sales have been lagging in London. And do you think the business model is not working there? Is it that you guys need to do more marketing abroad? No. Uh, the the Chipotle in London is just like Chipotle in uh, Chicago when it first opened up. Unknown brand, and there's a discovery process. So what we're seeing in London is very similar sales patterns th that we saw with Chipotle 10 or 15 years ago when we first entered new markets and nobody knew who we were. And what I mean by that is inconsistent sales in each of the restaurants, but it grows fast. I mean, there's a, there's a measure in the restaurant business called comp sales, which means take the restaurants you had open last year, what's the growth in just those restaurants? Don't count the new ones that you open, that's cheating, but you take the ones that you opened last year and are those growing? And what's happening, Chipotle's comp sales have grown significantly as this discovery about Chipotle and people have come in. That's happened in the US over time. The same thing's happening in London. So we just believe it's a matter of a timeline that we're seeing very similar things that we saw uh, you know, back in the old day, we're seeing very similar things in London today. So we're very encouraged by, by Chipotle in London and in Paris uh, and in Frankfurt as well. And by the way, in Canada, the sales out in Canada are actually higher than the U.S. So it's already doing better than we are here in the U.S. 
Yes. Okay, so you talked about putting the money into the good quality food. Right. And you've talked about your good quality employees. Where in the business model is your cost for these employees? Because I'm assuming you have to spend quite a bit if you want good we do. quality employees. Yeah, we do. The thing that we do the most is we invest in their development. And so let me give you an example. Um, somebody who starts at, at Crew, and there are specific people I can think of, making, let's say they start at nine bucks an hour. Our, our, our average hourly rate is close to, is right around $10 for all our hourly people. But you wouldn't, we wouldn't start at, no, at 10. Let's say you start at 8.50 or nine or something like that. Uh, you can get to the next level of manager within a matter of three or four or five months. You can get to the next level. Now the average is 12 months, but that's the average. And there's people that get there as soon as three. There are some that take longer. You can get to the next level in three months after that. Okay, then there's the next level, the next level. So within a couple of years, you can go from crew to a manager, and then we have an elite manager called restaurateur in a matter of a couple of years. When you get to restaurateur with your salary, your bonus, your people bonus, company car, and stock options, it could be a $100,000 package. Okay? We've had people that started nine years ago as crew that are now running a whole region that with stock options and company, nicer company car. Um, they're making a half million bucks a year or so. So the opportunity is fantastic. And the way you succeed, the people that have done this make others better. Okay, the way we measure your success, if you make others around you better, we'll want to have you influence more people. And if you make them better, we'll want you to broaden your leadership experience. And if you're really exceptional at making others better, leading others and empowering others to be the best they can be, you can have a very successful career at Chipotle. Any other questions? I think we're probably out of time. Well, we got more time. We got time for one more question. Uh, one more question. I want to do a part quickly. So. Oh, yeah, of course. We'll do it right here. So, um, Jack, I've got a question here from Elise. She's a communications major. Uh, what is one thing you think students need to prepare for in today's workplace that can set eyes to graduates apart? Okay. God, that's a great, great, great question. Um, the advice that I would give, and it's the same advice that I've, I've got five kids. Uh, three of them are out of, four of them are out of college, um, one still in college, is uh, uh, when you go after something, go after it, okay? Don't do it halfway. Go after something that you're excited about. And even if it's not the perfect job, my first job out of school, remember all those degrees President Dietz said I had and all those certifications? I had them all when I left. And you know what I did my first job? I did bank reconciliations, okay? I went to companies, I was an auditor, I went to companies and I checked outstanding checks to make sure that the outstanding checks really were outstanding. But I didn't say I'm above this. I said, oh my God, I'm going to learn everything I can about bank wrecks and I'm going to show my bosses that I'm going to do a great job with this. And when you do that, they ask you to do more and take on more responsibility. Okay? So whatever you do, go after it. Okay? I don't care what it is. And, and, and it's ideal if you can work for a company that has a vision, that's going someplace, you know, and that you believe in what they're doing, okay? Don't, don't go after making a lot of money. If you do what you love, if you go after it, and if you work for a company that has a vision that's going places, you'll make all the money you need, more than you ever thought possible. But don't do it halfway. When you show up for an interview, show them how enthusiastic you are about being part of their company. Show them how much energy you have. Show them confidence that you should have coming from ISU. The experience that you're getting, the investment you're making in yourself today should give you confidence to really show the energy and enthusiasm you have for that job. And if you go after that, if you have to clean toilets your first job, do it better than anyone else. And then they're going to ask you to do the next thing, and the next thing, and the next thing. That's my biggest advice. I, th I think a lot of students, and I saw this with my own kids, they're looking past it. They're looking to the promotion, three promotions down the road. Don't do that. Okay? Do the best job you can, and guess what? The promotions will come at you faster than you could ever imagine. So that'd be my advice. Great question. Okay. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you for all those questions. As a final note, uh, there will be a networking reception in the outside atrium. Light hors d'oeuvres will be served. I'd like to thank you for attending our keynote speaker this afternoon in our final event of Business Week 2015. Proof of attendance slips are available at the door, and we strongly encourage all those that are interested to please sign up for Business Week 2016. Application is available at our website, www.cob.ils2.edu.
www.edu. Please join me one last time in thanking Mr. Jack Hartown.